We're back, everyone. Welcome to Subjectively, the channel where we discuss character design in the context of popular media. My name is Jack. My name is Clara. And today, we've got a bit of a new twist on a popular video formula. Most of you are probably familiar with our Redesigning League of Legends Champions video series. They're a fun way for us to explore what we like and don't like about modern character designs and talk about one of our favorite video game worlds. Of course, criticizing existing designs and coming up with one that's entirely our own are two very different things. So far, we've only done the former on this channel. We asked you guys around a month ago if you'd rather see us redesign another unpopular champion or take a crack at designing a completely new one. About 80% of you voted in favor of the new champion, and we were excited to take a walk down the path less traveled. Of course, designing an entirely new champion to fit into the world of League of Legends would be a lot of work. Unlike the redesign videos, this project gave us no specific source material to work from. No lore, no visuals, no point of origin or connection to the rest of the story in the way that characters like Shivana, Gragas, or Skarner have. We may complain that the existing information available about some characters in League is lacking, but at least there's something. Here, we started completely from scratch. This video is going to be an exploration of the general creative process behind designing a character as much as it will be about League of Legends. Where to start, what to consider, and what technical skills are important along the way. The video you're watching right now will be part one of two, encompassing the first stages of the design process, our rough sketches, and early designs. Part two will focus on the end product, the final design, lore and backstory, kit, and splash art. For now though, we're going to kick things off at the very beginning. Every artist works differently, and while we do have our own unique methods when it comes to character design, we used this project as an opportunity to learn more about how Riot's art team approaches creating a completely new champion. I researched the design process of professional Riot artists to understand the rigorous creative practices that make League's champion design so iconic. Though it's impossible for every fan to love all of the same designs, there's no denying that there are some really strong concepts and visuals among the vast roster of playable characters. The Riot art team's work is industry standard, and any artist aspiring to work in the realm of video game character design could learn a lot from the creatives behind the designs. Anyway, our process began in the same way as official champions, with a mission statement. A mission statement is kind of like a thesis for a written paper. It sums up as succinctly as possible what your goal is as the artist in regards to the character you want to create. It's important at this stage in the process to be as vague as possible. I know a lot of us, myself included, have a tendency to come up with a very structured concept for a character that includes story, visuals, and even an established personality right from the start. That's not wrong, nor should it be discredited as an illegitimate method for character design. However, for a project like this, with such an open-ended prompt, it's much more helpful to go into the process with an open mind. This way, you can explore many different possible visual and conceptual solutions and see with your own eyes which design works best. All we knew going into this project was that we wanted to connect our other most popular subject matter on the channel, Pokemon, into a League of Legends champion in some way. Primarily, we wanted to capture the relationship between a young human and a powerful monster, but adapted for the League of Legends world. Our mission statement helped us stay focused on this goal and made sure we didn't accidentally reinvent the wheel with Nunu and Willump 2. Our mission statement was, a young child has come of age, inheriting a great power in the form of a magical non-human creature. They must grow together to learn how to work as one. Without being too specific, our mission statement gave us a helpful framework to design around. In addition to a mission statement, Riot artists use three pillars of design to help clarify their rough concept and keep their team focused on the same goal. The pillars are categorized as visual, narrative, and gameplay, and we had a bit of a job cutting these down to be as brief as possible. Editing is always the hardest part of any artistic endeavor. Our visual pillar is human and monster partners. Our narrative pillar is youth versus inherited responsibility. And our gameplay pillar, which was the hardest part for us to figure out, is Adaptive Energetic Fighter. This was our starting line. 
At this point, we had no visuals, no sketches, nothing. All we knew was our mission statement and our three pillars of design. From here, we started exploring visuals. Sketches that we felt met the criteria of our mission statement and that, of course, looked cool. The beauty of working with a world as fleshed out as Runeterra, the setting of the League of Legends universe, is that there are tons of existing visuals to borrow from. What's more, there are established stories, civilizations, cultures, and creatures that we can consider in regards to how our character will look and what role they will play in the overarching story. We said at the beginning of this video that we were working entirely from scratch, but that's not really entirely true. After we spent a few days in the rough sketch stage, Jack and I paused to discuss our progress and make a decision about where to take the character next. Um, so that's the sort of approach we want to take with this, where we want to explore many different kinds of visual uh, possibilities uh, with the champion in terms of where it comes from. And we picked regions that we feel like might have a lot more room for exploration and maybe haven't been explored as much. Yeah, um, in going, the game. going into this, we were really talking about Ixtal and my later concepts, I ended up sort of moving away from Ixtal because there were just other things I became more excited about. Um, but Ixtal, in our opinion, is one of the most underdeveloped regions. Since we're, we're talking about Ixtal, we can do uh, the champion idea that I had, which actually, uh, in a reverse manner of the rest of the, the designs I came up with, this one I just did a silhouette for the monster part of the, the champion, and then I fleshed out the character design a little bit more because, again, like, they do have a a, a consistent visual identity for Ishtal and like specifically mm -hmm. Ishokan in this big city yeah. that has a lot of Mesoamerican influence, a lot of South American influence, and kind of takes this great magical kingdom uh, in a completely different direction from that kind of European, um, like Damasio or Noxus sort of look. Um, so I wanted to look at some different ways to explore those kinds of, that fashion style, very geometric, a lot of uh, angular lines and intricate little shapes. Um, so I had fun doing that. And my concept behind this one, this was actually the third concept I came up with, this is the last one. Um, but my concept behind this one was the young character, it's still a young human. And this is rough, but basically her family is, a, has been taking care of or is the in charge of this great beast that is sort of like this primal force that lives within the jungles of Ixtal. I guess we should say um, on the outset of going over these specific concepts, there is a lot of vagueness intentional in these early designs because in this stage of exploration, it doesn't really make sense to get really tied up in the details. Right, but anyway, the idea here is that she has inherited now the responsibility of taking care of this great beast that is actually feared by the people within the walls of the city of Ishokan. So her family has been in exile because their job is to keep this terrible monster at bay. Now she has become uh, the, the person in charge of it and she's starting to think like, wait, why is one of the greatest powers in Ishtal being rejected? by our leaders, like, shouldn't we be embracing this power? And I know everyone's afraid of it. And like, maybe in the past, her family has just like kept it at bay, but now she's sort of like, I wanna work with it and use it to help us spread the influence of uh, Ixtal and the Ishokan. I, I like this design. I like that I like that the language in the beast is not totally foreign to the sort of visual uh, traits we see in the existing jungle monsters. So it's kind of familiar to the world of Runeterra already. So yeah, that's that was our uh, Ixtal. Did you do an Ixtal design? I did. I had some early exploration. I guess this is all early exploration. Is this the Ixtal ones? Yeah, my first two sketches, which were very rough. Um, the one on the right is Ixtal. Mm -hmm. Uh, I wanted to explore a couple of different tropes of um, beast and adolescent relationships. And I was thinking of um, Nico's wildness a little bit in this, and also um, how hidden and sort of secretive uh, the external nation is. And I was just picturing this child that is either abandoned or lost in the jungle and has this sort of old school grows up with the wildlife. Yeah, raised story. by wolves. Right, and I was thinking the razor beaks would be like a really good um, 
very visually graphic beast that also I think people could relate to because it's like a big chicken kind of thing. <laughs> so you're, you're in this design, it's literally the razor beaks, like the same animals that you get in the camps. I was thinking this would be but it's like a more, more mature Yeah, even bigger than the ones you see. I ended up moving away from this design just because the trope wasn't something I was super excited about, but I wanted that like element of wildness. Maybe it is of a Styan child also, and it mimics some of the body language of its, um, you know, adopted brother, sister, whatever. Yeah, it looks a little of a Styan. Right. Um, so uh, what is the other character on this page? So um, the other one, I was trying to think of animals that are easy to relate to. And I started thinking about whales and dolphins and aquatic mammals. And I was trying to think about what in particular might be interesting to explore both from a visual angle and from a gameplay angle relating to those aquatic mammals. And I was thinking about how dolphins sleep with half of their brain. Um, and so they're like never truly uh, asleep. They sleep with half of their brain at a time and they're kind of on autopilot. And it got me thinking about this idea of maybe a Targonian child who is the like aspect of dreams or something, mm. who has this bond with this ancient spirit and each of them is part of a whole and only one of them can be conscious at a time. And this would uh, complement a gameplay perspective also where maybe you're controlling the child or the dolphin spirit um, and you have a different kit and you know, something like that. So I was thinking of some more uh, tribal uh, outfits. Maybe the child is in something a little bit simpler to reflect how they aren't really a warrior. They're kind of just a person who has inherited this responsibility. Um, the shape language I was looking at, uh, Diana and Leona's tribe in Targon. Um, and I was thinking with this weapon that's kind of simultaneously like a shape you would see in maybe a, vill a village that eats a lot of fish, like spear fishing, but also almost like a pointer, like you point at a place and then the dolphin goes there. Kind of like a little command stick. Right. Yeah. Um, and I, I actually like this design a lot. I think I do it's too. pretty cute. I think what's missing is the dolphin is too literal. Um, yeah, and I kind of refine this basic concept a little bit more in a later iteration. But of my earliest sketching, this was the idea I felt was worthy of further development. Um, and it's funny that you were saying you were thinking of like animals that humans can easily create a, a connection with because I was also thinking cetaceans, whales, dolphins, porpoises, etc. Um, another region I wanted to explore was Bilgewater um, because I like the whole pirate, you know, nautical theme. Um, and I had two different ideas because another um, relationship I wanted to explore between the human character and the non-human character was one of dissonance, sort of like they don't get along. Mm -hmm. And so I, I called this concept the reluctant partners. And this is idea 2B. I also had 2A, which is just a different monster, but the same sort of implied relationship. That's a whale, not a B. <laughs> this is, sorry, this is 2, two, w. two w. That flows. Um, and so, yeah, this was sort of, it's, I mean, it takes similar animal references, but the relationship between the human and the monster are, is very different. This is like a young kid. I was imagining a young kid who has to sort of take care of themselves uh, in the very hostile region of Bilgewater. Yeah, it, looking at Bilgewater and exploring it in the extended universe, it really seems like there's a lot of orphans. It's really hard yeah. to survive in a place like there. Yeah, yeah there's <laughs> scurvy and criminals and murder and like the only honest job you can get is like hunting giant monsters out at sea, which you're probably gonna die doing. Yeah, I'm not sure yet what the connection would be between the two characters and why they do stay together. Like I see why the kid would want to stay with the whale, but I'm not sure yet why the whale would want to stay with the kid. Yeah. Um, I don't know. This one is not a story that I, it doesn't have as much of a story as my other ideas. Um, I just liked the visuals of having this like big whale dog bear sidekick. So yeah, you had another idea um, that also was a Bilgewater idea. 
Yeah, I was thinking, I, I was really inspired by the artwork that just came out in Legends of Runeterra for Alawi and her whole set of cards. And um, I just really wanted to explore that really cool visual language. The artwork is so cool. I loved the really stylized handling of the armor and also just the tentacle shapes. It was so cool and just such an opinionated expression of Alawi's personality. And uh, it expanded on the Buru lore, Alawi's people. Um, so I was thinking about just a different way to go about this relationship. I had this first concept on the left here that I liked, but I wanted to not feel too married to it. Um, so then I went back to my first impulse to find an animal that felt easy to relate to. Uh, and that's like, you know, man's best friend is a dog. So I was thinking about the way the avatar of Naga Kuburos looked in The Ruined King with this carved tentacle beast. And I was thinking, okay, what if there was another creature that was a combination of relic and spectral tentacles? And I created this like dog mask. It's not too literally a dog, but I was imagining that like animation trope where something isn't a dog, but it acts like a dog. Yeah, cocks its head, it has ears. Right. Um, and so then I was thinking about another relationship um, someone could have with this spirit animal. And it's like, okay, what if it's like a puppy that really is not ready for the world yet? And it's supposed to be a guardian of the Buru or a guardian of the avatar of Naga Kaboros or something, but it's very young and it's immature and it needs a lot of direction. So I designed this Buru woman who has a big like whistle weapon and she is an accomplished warrior, but she's also like a, a dog trainer in a way. <laughs> Basically, there's a better way to say that, I'm sure. But her inherited responsibility is this annoying puppy that is mich mischievous and wants to please, but doesn't really know how and needs a lot of direction and time. I gotcha. Yeah, that, that would work too. And I guess is the other idea on the left side here is this sort of a similar concept to the sleepwalker kind of a dolphin looking. Yeah, I would say this is the more refined version of my first concept where I really committed to Lunari visuals. Um, and I looked at the expanded universe again for shape language in the Lunari's ceremonial outfits mm -hmm. and um, the way they adorn themselves. There's like almost a crescent moon shape on her forehead now that I was thinking might be like a brand from the goddess. Yeah. Uh, and evidence of the connection she has with this creature now. Um, the weapon probably still needs to be refined, but now it's like uh, crystal shapes. And I was thinking if it's still that pointer idea, it like creates this otherworldly glow wherever she's directing the beast. Yeah, so I can see that. It's. It's like a laser pointer now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see it. She literally. Oh, right. that's good for like the joke emote. Right. That's good. Yeah, I like that. I also had a, a Targonian concept. The first one that I did actually um, was set in Targon, um, and I also wanted to do like um, an idea because all of the aspects that are characters in the game right now have hosts that are just a mortal human and the aspect, you don't ever actually see the aspect. There's no visual representation of the aspect. All of their powers are used through their once mortal host. Um, but I was thinking here and with the other ideas that we've talked about for Targon, the aspect would still be there, um, at least for the player to see. But in this concept, I was thinking that this young human would play uh, the role of host to an aspect. I'm not sure of aspect of what friendship, teamwork, something like that. Um, but she also has a really close friend in this aspect who doesn't take advantage of her in any way. It's just like this really friendly, I was actually, I put some tiger influence in there because I was kind of thinking Calvin and Hobbes mm -hmm. a little bit. But yeah, I mean, this again has that sort of thing um, where it's like, it could look dangerous, it could look hostile. You know, I think most people would agree that tigers are as fearsome as they are cute. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's got that duality to it where it's like, I can either be friends with this and pet it or I can sick it on my foes. Um, and it's still like a kitty. Yeah, and I wanted them to look like they're, they have a cute, friendly relationship. This is like the only one where like the two are really sincerely friends. And the only reason I didn't explore that more was because 
I feel like that sort of relationship is kind of Nunu and Willem's yeah, thing. Yeah, we, we have to be really careful um, not to tread on the toes of Nunu and Willem, Sejuani and Bristle, yeah. and Kled and Skarl. Yeah. Because those are the other really defined collaborative relationships between human and beast that already exist in the Rift. So the question is, can we take those designs and repurpose them to fit in Ishtal, or should we just ditch Ishtal? The thing about Ishtal is that I like that design. It, it's hard to say because at a certain point it comes down to player bias. Um, you know, since we're just a team of two people, we we don't have this like market research that the actual designers mm. at Riot would have that says, okay, we need a really appealing, cute champion from this region. Or, you know, we need a really like rough monster that fulfills the like dragon tamer fantasy or we need some a sweet relationship that will appeal more to gentler fans well you know? i'll tell you what we can do we could do a community poll that's true maybe Bef that's a good next step because before I... we continue with development we can say which concept do you guys like best or we could just say which region do you think you would want to see a character from i think we should show these concepts because i was going to say i'm looking at the ishtal concept and that's like a t-rex that's like so jack core <laughs> it is very and biased towards me then i look at the cute dolphin and tiger and i'm like okay well i would naturally gravitate towards these much gentler sweeter relationships so in that sense we're somewhat at an impasse why don't we do that though? Why don't we, I mean, it won't take long to get an idea of where the majority is leading to yeah. in a uh, community poll. So before we keep working on this today, why don't we let the fans decide which, idea. which idea they're gravitating most to and, uh, and we'll, we'll move from there. Okay. Yeah, that is, that's good. And maybe we'll close the window the next time we record <laughs> because someone's <laughs> having a beach party be, or something. I don't know what the uh, f is happening out there. Ambient noise. The artists at Riot have a whole team to consult when designing a new champion, something that's invaluable to the design process. We, of course, are just two people. So getting the feedback from our fans helped us fill that void in our own creative team and gave us a clear idea of which concepts were the strongest. We uploaded a poll to our community post page and shared with you all five different concepts to vote on. To our surprise, there was an overwhelming majority in favor of my reluctant partners concept. Claire and I both agreed that this was not one of our favorite concepts out of the bunch, but we learned two things based on your feedback in the comments. The dynamic between the two characters was appealing and novel in the context of League of Legends, and people like whales. I've noticed this before, actually, in my Mermaid and Smogus drawing challenges. I did a few cetacean designs during both months, and they were my most popular pieces. This feedback, combined with our discussion and initial concepts, led us to a conclusive direction in which we could take this character moving forward. Though the majority of votes favored Jack's reluctant partner's concept, we both agreed that the design itself was somewhat flat. Bilgewater, the region that the character took inspiration from, has several different visual identities associated with it. The somewhat generic yet appealing fantasy pirate motif has already been explored in champions like Gangplank, Misfortune, Pike, and Graves, but there's another side to Bilgewater that has really only been fleshed out in spin-off games. My idea for a Buru Tamer brings Alawi's people into the spotlight and expands on the often overlooked subject matter of cosmic horror-inspired cult worship that the Buru embody. We decided to use the Buru as our key visual theme, setting up our new champion as a young tribe member just coming of age. The visuals of the Buru borrow from real-world cultures like those found in the Pacific Islands, Mesoamerica, and Australia. Within the fictional world of Runeterra, the Buru inhabit one of the several islands comprising the Serpent Isles. Their culture is focused around the goddess of motion, Naga Kaburos, who preaches the value of a strong will. The goddess's messages are relayed through priestesses called truth bearers, such as Alawi. These priestesses will test the fortitude of potential followers and deem them worthy of the goddess's blessing. Such tests take on many forms, and while we as fans are only familiar with those set forth and endured by Alawi, we as designers thought it might be fun to expand on these mystical trials. 
Keeping our mission statement in mind, we thought a good way to incorporate a young child has come of age, inheriting great power, into this design was by introducing a new member of the Buru people. Younger than Rel, but older than Nunu and Annie, this tween has only just begun to earn her place among the ranks of powerful warriors that make up the great Buru tribe. Before she can really call herself a priestess of Nagake Boros, however, she must endure a test of her own. A test of patience, set forth by the goddess herself and taking on the form of some massive, powerful, and stubborn beast with whom she must learn to cooperate. She is to set out from her home in the Serpent Isles with this new partner, and may only return when she has mastered the art of teamwork. Patience will be key. I made a few sketches to explore the potential design for the human character. She needed to look young, small, and relatively inexperienced when compared to the majority of other champions in League of Legends. We didn't want her to feel incompetent, though. Any child raised in the unforgiving region of Bilgewater is worth their salt. Tough, tenacious, and determined. Exploring costume design was a lot of fun, and the established visual motifs for the Buru aligned with my personal aesthetics as an artist. A lot of organic shapes like spirals and curves, with heavy armor pieces worn alongside flowing fabrics and jewelry. I also used this time to explore some weapon designs. Her most powerful weapon, of course, would be her monster partner. As we have it now, though, her monster isn't always on the field with her. She summons and controls the beast using a magical instrument that doubles as a blunt weapon. These three ideas were early versions of what this weapon may look like. While Jack worked on the human concepts, I started visual exploration with the monster partner. My initial Buru Tamer concept had her partner as a dog-like spirit complete with ethereal tentacles like those already present in the Nagakuboros iconography. Jack and I agreed that we wanted to make the monster more whale-like, as it was pretty clear from the feedback we received that this is one of the main reasons it was so popular. Jack made a mood board, another step borrowed from the Riot creative process that compiled a lot of our previous reference material alongside new inspiration and real-life references. From this mood board, which included everything from orca skulls to ruined king concept art, I began sketching. My first beast concept returned to a somewhat dog-like form since people readily empathize with dogs and that would help underpin a nuanced relationship between the two characters. However, the harrowing image of rows and rows of killer whale teeth from our mood board was really sticking with me, so I experimented with a carved-looking skull and skeletal anatomy. It quickly became apparent that this design was missing the mark emotionally, and I think the skull also would have been a barrier to making the character emote. Rather than sink time into a design that wasn't working, I continued my exploration with a different concept. This second design also incorporated orca features, but expressed them in a way that could either read as grumpy or friendly. I ended up with a body type that borrowed a lot from grizzly bears, but also took advantage of orca markings to reflect established guru motifs. I was really trying to find a way to make this whale creature look the part of an energetic fighter to match her gameplay pillar without sacrificing recognizable cetacean imagery. While the exact equipment of our monster would need to change to match the human character, I polished this design off with some Buru tattoos and trinkets lifted from the extended universe for the time being. I also wanted to take a crack at designing the monster and, like Claire, did two sketches. Also like Claire, I made one more organic, like a living creature native to the Serpent Isles, and one more ethereal, like a summoned spirit. The organic design had a smug personality, referencing my very first design a little bit more. The massive curved mouth of a bowhead whale made for an excellent smile that seemed to say, oh yeah, you think you're the boss? This design was very terrestrial looking, quadrupedal like a rhino or an elephant, but with a whale's tail that honestly meh, seems a little unnecessary. To connect the creature to Nagake Boros and the Boru people, I also included some tattoos and a thick harness that could either be used as a saddle or a collar to be led around by the human character. My second design leaned more into the creepy, otherworldly side of the spectrum. Taking inspiration from Alawi's idol, I fashioned the head of this design into a much more menacing facade. I was also inspired by the skulls of orcas, with their long jaws and massive interlocking teeth. This, along with some skeletal arms protruding from behind it, would be the only physical, solid parts of the anatomy. The rest of the creature would be made up of glowing, semi-transparent tentacles like those in Claire's original sketch. In this concept, the creature would swim through the air like Aurelian Soul, Velkaz, or the newly introduced Belveth. 
A floating design might help improve visual clarity, depending on how we decide to work the kit and whether or not both characters will be on screen at the same time. Jack doesn't really enjoy designing gameplay kits for champions, but I actually really do. To ensure that all three of our pillars of design were fulfilled for this video, I came up with an early gameplay concept to give you all a rough idea of our current direction for this champion's kit. While it's obviously important to emphasize the relationship between human and monster in a unique way through execution of gameplay mechanics, there are other big considerations that need to be reflected in the champion's abilities. For one, we're somewhat settled on making this champion's weapon a hybrid blade slash instrument. We were thinking this would simultaneously provide our design with a unique silhouette, and also imply that music could be a communication or training tool between the two characters. Obviously, not incorporating such an ostentatious design choice into gameplay would be a total failure of design. Also, since these characters have been brought together under the pretense of Nagakaboros' test of patience, themes of patience and learning together needed to be present as well. With all that said, this is what I came up with. Passive 1. Patience. Casting full whistle combos grants stacks of patience, which gives character increased adaptive force when monster is active. Patience can stack up to three times, and decays when character is not in combat. Passive 2. Practice makes perfect. Every time a full whistle combo is completed when in combat with an enemy champion or epic monster, Whistle's cooldown is reduced slightly, up to a maximum additional X ability haste. Q. Whistle. Active Effect. Character begins whistling, empowering the effect of their next activation of W or E and grants a small burst of movement speed. Casting twice in a row further empowers their next ability and grants a stack of patience. Casting Whistle a third time in a row changes its effect to Percussion. Percussion. Character swings their whistle axe, dealing moderate damage in a cleave and briefly stuns enemies in the middle. W. Hop. Active effect. Characters hop a short distance, though not over walls. If this ability is empowered, it can travel a greater distance and over walls. If beast is active, it also deals damage. E. Beast mode. Active effect. Character summons Beast, gaining increased adaptive force depending on patient stacks. Character has increased range when Beast is active. When empowered, gain a decaying percent health shield for 3 seconds after summoning Beast. Beast will vanish when patient stacks are depleted. While Beast is active, this ability changes to Thrash. Thrash. Beast attacks a nearby target for high damage. This ability holds charges equal to patient stacks. When empowered, Thrash hits additional targets up to two. R, as one, passive effect. Each time Beast is summoned, patience will decay more slowly. Active, instantly gain max patient stacks. Beast will howl alone to each cast of Whistle for a limited time, empowering each ability equal to two casts of Whistle. Okay, sorry, I know it sounds like a lot, but I don't think these tools would actually be too overwhelming in practice, though they would likely take some getting used to. One thing Jack and I want to be very conscious of is carving out a unique design and gameplay space among the current League roster, so it's actually kind of important that the kit feels a little unlike other champions, especially the ones that are two distinct entities working in tandem, such as Kindred or Kled and Skarl. While keeping in mind traits of the fighter archetype, I tried to balance mobility, bulk, damage, and crowd control options in a way that is on par with recent champion releases. Anyway, let us know what you think of this early gameplay iteration in the comments, because we definitely want to develop this aspect of our design further as well. Obviously, this champion is far from done. We've done very little exploration in the way of color, we still need to settle on a final design for the monster and the human, and to make sure both look cohesive with one another, hell, we don't even have a name for them yet. This is where you guys come in. Please share your thoughts and feedback for this champion design to help us move forward. This is only part one, and we'd love your input for the final design that we'll reveal in part two. Any thoughts you have from costume design, to lore, to kit, we'd love to hear it. 
You guys are going to help us create this champion, and we're as excited as you are to see them finished. Thank you guys so much for watching. Be sure to stay tuned for part two, and stick around for my next drawing challenge, Kaijun. I'll be drawing giant monsters and robots every day for the month of June. Peace, and we'll see you all in the next video.